Welcome to Doxadeo City Changers.
Son of man, the stories of a savior, holiness with human hand, a treasure for the traitor. No ear it or no eye it see the image of the Father. Until heaven came to live with me A rescue like no other Yes, you are worthy You are worthy of your name Yes, you Stand by my side 
Engaging our city. Some of you might even say, How, where do I even start? Have you seen my school? Have you seen my university? Have you seen my place of work? There's not even a hint of Jesus there. I don't know where to begin. How do I engage a place that seems godless? That seems like there's no way Jesus will ever be in this place. Now, um, 2,000 years ago, Paul entered the city of Athens. And as he entered the city of Athens, he could have said exactly the same words. How can I do anything in this place? We read in Acts 17 verse 16, While Paul was waiting for them, that's Timothy and Silas, in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Now Paul was a monotheist. He believed in one triune God. There's only one God. He was trained in this theology, and that was his only way of thinking about God. And Athens was full of idols. Petronius, an historian, said, It was easier to find a God in Athens than it was to find a man. Some historians say that the gods outnumbered men three to one. So for every person living in Athens, there was a place of worship or a shrine or an altar for worship of another god. So Paul had any in and every reason to leave the city, but he engaged the city. And we read in Acts 17 verse 7, So he reasoned in the synagogue with both the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them even asked, What is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seemed to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Now if the Bible had a soundtrack, it would have gone bum bum bum. Something's going to happen. Now the question is, where is your marketplace? Where is the place you can start conversations? At work, at school, with your friends. Where is that place? What if you started conversations there? Paul moved his circle of concern to his circle of influence. He started to getting influence in the city. Verse 19 we read, Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus. Now the Areopagus is where the city leaders, leaders met. And they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we'd like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent all their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. And Paul started. He said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. Religious can be translated as extremely devout, much given to religious worship. Paul is not being sarcastic. He's busy winning them over. He's not attacking the people. When you attack people, the walls go up and dialogue ends. But he's starting the dialogue. He realizes the people of Athens need for meaning and purpose. We live in a world where people are looking for meaning and purpose. They're looking in strange places. We can Google thousands and thousands of ideas. Much like the gods in Athens, thousands of them, hundreds of them. We can Google all these ideas to find meaning and purpose. But Paul knew there's only one place where we can find meaning and purpose. Your friends are looking for meaning and purpose. Your colleagues are looking for, what's, why am I here? And Paul takes them to this Jesus. In John 10, Jesus says, I came so they can have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. So Paul engages Athenian culture. He says, For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, 
I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The moment he said the word, the unknown God, he triggered history out of Athens. He triggered the story they all knew very well. And it showed that Paul took very deep interest in their story. Because in the 6th century before Christ, in the city of Athens, was hit by a massive and severe plague. One of the historians writes, said, The plague started, it first settled in your head, then it ran its course through your whole body, and it left its mark on your fingers and extremities. If you survived, you lost your fingers, your toes, your eyesight, and there were entire memory loss. You couldn't even remember yourself or your friends. It's a terrible plague. And they consulted the best doctors. They couldn't get any healing. They made sacrifices to every god. Nothing worked. And the plague continued. And so they got the leaders together on the Areopagus and they said, we need to do something. And they said, there's a legendary oracle. He knows the world of the gods. Let's get him in. And they called Epimenides from another island. Now Epimenides was one of the most respected oracles in the ancient world. He understood the world of the gods, how they thought and how they walked the earth. Epimenides is quoted twice in the New Testament, once in Titus and once in Acts. We're going to read about that now. As Epimenides stepped off the ship in Athens harbor, the signs of the plague were all over, and the scene was shocking and appalling. Epimenides was amazed by the amount of gods. And he said, maybe there's a God we do not know about. And the leaders of the city laughed at him because they were worshipping every possible God they could imagine. And Epimenides said, maybe that this, maybe this exact thing is your problem. Epimenides made his way up the hill to the Areopagus. And he said to the leaders of the city, tomorrow, come see me, but bring a flock of hungry sheep of different colors. They must be healthy. But tonight, after they have grazed, don't feed them anymore. Keep them in a cage or a camp. And tomorrow, bring this hungry sheep to me. So the next morning, they arrived there. They stood in front of the council. Everybody, sheep everywhere. And people gathered all around to see what's going to happen now. They had a hope that something must happen. Epimenides said, I'm going to make sacrifices based on three assumptions. One, there's a God out there we do not know about. Two, my second assumption is, if we invoke the help of this God, He is great enough and good enough to come to our aid. He's a gracious God. And three, this God is so great and so good, He cannot be captured in a statue made by man. He's larger than any other God. And Epimenides ordered the sheep to be released and go and graze. Then he prayed out loud to this unknown God, acknowledging their ignorance and asking this unknown God to, to make either the white or the black sheep go against their nature and not eat. And where they, and just lay down. And where they lay down, they will build an altar to this unknown God and sacrifice this sheep to the unknown God. And as they did it, they released the sheep. And amazingly, the black sheep started eating immediately. But the white sheep moved all over Athens, went against their nature, didn't eat. And they laid down in different places. And he ordered them to build altars right there where the white sheep lay. And, and sacrifice the sheep to the unknown God. And that very day, the plague began to lift. And within a week, nothing left. And the Athenians started to theorize. They said, if this unknown God would just reveal himself, they might be able to do away with the worship of all the others. And then the 600 years following that, this unknown God got known by a few characteristics. One, there is a God out there. We do not know about him. And he controls everything. He's the supreme God. Two, he's great enough and good enough to forgive and to heal. He's a gracious God. And three, this God is so great and so good, he cannot be captured in a statue or a shrine. So imagine how brilliant this is. Paul enters the scene. And he starts talking about this unknown God, a supreme God, a God who's gracious, a God who heals, and a God that cannot be captured in a statue or a shrine. So the moment he said that, their ears were like, oh my word, he's talking about the unknown God. 
And then he connects it to Jesus. And he said, this unknown God is Jesus. Paul does not explain the Jewish concept of monotheism. He doesn't quote one scripture in his entire sermon. Paul finds the one thing that people can relate to. Our faith in Christ is a journey. And often we confuse non-believers with our religious jargon. Paul, no religious jargon. He enters their world. He tries to understand their world. We see in verse 24, he says, The God who made the world and everything in it, the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples built by hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything, because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. He delicately presents the nature of God to them. He shows them the weakness of the idols, exposing them. We have such a beautiful gospel. The completed work of Christ. We have the most beautiful message to take out there. People looking for meaning and purpose. And in a world that people must perform. We must constantly perform to prove ourselves. People need to hear. It's done. There's no performance needed anymore. It's complete. You are accepted. What could happen if we started to live this message in our cities, in our schools, at our places of work, at our home? It's complete. No more performance. It's the best news ever. This is good news. We see more of Paul's genius in verse 28. See, he says, For in him we live and move and have our being. And some of our own poets say, we are his offspring. And when he said this, he's quoting Epimenides. And he's quoting Aratus. Aratus said, for indeed we are his offspring. And Epimenides said, for in him we live and move and have our being. So he uses the songs, the poetry, the art of their time. He's not bringing in some Jewish story. It's not working. It won't work for them. The Greeks could relate to the quotes. And we see Paul in action. We understand what he means when he writes in 1 Corinthians 9. Even though I'm free of the demands and expectations of everyone, I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people. Religious, non-religious, meticulous moralist, the loose living immoralist, the defeated, the demoralized. Whoever, I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ, but I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. I've become just about every sort of servant there is in my attempts to lead those I meet into a God-saved life. I did all of this because of the message. I didn't just want to talk about it. I wanted to be in on it. So beautiful. I want to be in on this message. I want to enter their world. I want to understand their culture. And I want to see the connections. I want to see how God, how big God really is. What do we learn from Paul? If you look at this story, if you listen to the story, a bit of the outside part of the story, what do we learn? Can you become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people? Are you prepared to become a servant? It's the first question we need to ask ourselves. The second one, can I be moved from concern to compassion? Not just see, oh, this, this place is godless, but really say, there must be something going on here. I'm sure Jesus is already working here. Can I live acceptance versus performance? Can I truly live that? Believe it for myself in the first place, that I am accepted. And then everybody else, they don't need to perform. It's already done in Jesus Christ. When Jesus said the word tetelestai, he really meant it is finished. It's complete. Can I live that when I engage the city? Can I reason with other people in non-confrontational ways? Really love them. Listen to them. Enter their world. Try to understand their point of view. Can I speak the language that people understand? Get rid of my Christianese and those weird words some Christians use. Really enter their world. I'm sure... There's Alpha courses all over your city. I'm sure you can 
if you're scared to engage the first step, take people to an alpha course. Take them to a group where they can have start having discussions about life and meaning. In verse 35, as, as the story ends, we read, A few men became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, so one of the city leaders. Also a woman named Damaris. If you're a woman named in the Bible, you're someone important. And a number of others. Some mocked Paul. Others wanted to hear more. And still joined him. And others still joined him and believed. Can you be moved, like Paul, from concern to compassion to enter your marketplace and influence that place? With us on the program today, we are privileged to have Bianca van Amerwe here. Now, Bianca is going to share with us something about her life being changed after school as part of Metamorpho. And um, we're going to just hear her testimony and what God is doing in her life. Bianca, welcome. It's great to have you here. And um, Metamorpho, I think not everybody know about. But before we go into what Metamorpho is, just maybe tell us where did you grow up? What are you doing at the moment? People just know who Bianca is. Okay, so um, I grew up in Pretoria North. I was homeschooled my whole life. Okay. I had two sisters, uh, one older, one younger. And at the moment, I just came back from overseas and mm -hmm. I'm currently looking to move to the Cape um, to pursue my art career. And Fantastic. A bit of an artist then. Hmm. Um, what were you doing overseas, if I might ask? Um, I was actually an au pair in Virginia wow. for nine months. What so an experience. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Now, Bianca, we're going to talk a bit about your life journey up till now. Um, so, after school, every st uh, teenager must decide what now. Uh, this big wide world lying ahead of you. You want to make a, an impact in the world, you know, make your mark. People must know who you are, but firstly, you must find out who you are yourself. So, how did the whole decision making uh, take place for you? And then tell us a bit of Metamorpho and how you actually then got to Metamorpho. Okay, so, uh, well, my sister, my older sister, did Target Life, which is a lot like Meta. And um, so my parents have always known about Mieta because other family members of ours did Mieta. Okay. Um, but I never wanted to do a structured anything after school. I felt that school was already structured enough, despite the fact that I had homeschooling. Um, mm. I wanted something, I wanted to be in a place where I could decide what I was doing and where I could make all the decisions and where okay. I could basically just be where I wanted to be. So I never wanted to do Mieta. Just before we go into going to Mieta, just what is Mieta again? Metamorpho. For me personally, um, it's just it's a year that you put out aside after your like gap school. Year, it's a gap year. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a platform. It's a safe platform where you can go and be yourself. A, uh, it's a bit of a bubble away from your normal life, away from your parents, and away from school and all your the, away from the rest of your whole life, mm. um, where you can think and grow and be exposed to things that you really wouldn't have been exposed to okay. any other So it's way. like an investment in a young person's life before yeah. the rest of your life yeah. is happening. Yeah. Okay, but now your parents knew this. Yeah. They heard of it and they wanted you to go. So you were saying your emotions around that. I, I, I was pretty much set against it. Mm. Um, and they basically told me I had to. <laughs> so I realized that I can either do Mieta with a attitude of, I don't want to be here and I could actually learn nothing or I can decide that it is a good thing, whether I want to do it or not, it seems okay, so let's just give it a try. Okay. And I did. Mm. So, yeah. And what year was this again? 2016. 2016. Two, two years okay. ago. So the year started, you went there. Tell us your experience. What happened in that year? Were you a Christian by that time or yes, not? Yes. Okay, so, so when did you actually meet God? I was raised a Christian. My parents are Christian. Okay. Um, I think I was about 13 when I, I started having questions for myself, when it became less of a, this is what my parents are telling me, and more of a, this is what I believe, and this is what I have been, ex I have experienced in my own life. Mm. So it becomes from an idea to something real for Personal. you then. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so that starts when I was about 13, and I'm still at a stage of questioning, and I'm, I'm a, definitely a lot more solid Christian now, but I'm still questioning and asking Figuring and not just, out, hey. yeah, yeah. yeah um, so Mieta was for me, it was a very overwhelming year, to be honest. It was very busy, especially in comparison to my homeschooling, quiet mm. life. It was like 27 girls thrown in one commune. It's 
oh my gosh, there were some wild, wild, crazy girls. Um, <laughs> I thought that you would only meet girls like that, like, I don't know, in the movies or something, but they're real. Um, <laughs> and it was a year of exposure and a year of perspective for me. I think that was the biggest thing for me in that year was just, mm. this is a place where you are now look at the world like this. Okay, now look at the world like this. Look at the world from this person's perspective. Okay, now look at the world from that person's eyes. Okay. And you are really just, especially, especially for me, the, um, the people that you come into contact with, mm. because you're almost forced together in this year, you, you, go, you go on camps that are difficult. You go on, um, you live together in the same room. Mm. You do things that you never would have done out of yourself. You do with these people and you're forced to rub against them in mm. a way and in that way you see parts of them that and you see parts of life and you see parts of God that you wouldn't have seen in any other way. Basically what you're experiencing is a preparation for, for the real world. Hey, because you would have faced different perspectives, different opinions, different ways, like weird people, like you said. Mm -hmm. But now Metamorpho creates the safe environment where during the camps, during the courses, the special weeks um, of addressing your past and looking at your identity, it's almost a place where you can, in a safe environment, like you said, like a little bubble for a time, mm -hmm. just discover yourself, who God is preparing you for the real big world that's not that protective after such a year mm -hmm. was i mean is that something that was real for you that you could really after that year say you know what these kind of things really happened in my life what maybe what are those things that you say if it wasn't for metamorpho i would have never discovered or grown in these specific areas i think i think the biggest thing for me was was people um i i spoke about how you're forced to rub against people. Mm. And it, has, it is so huge. Um, a friend of mine that I actually met in Mieta, that I'm still really good friends with, mm. she has this saying, um, when, she first, when I first met her, she would say it, and I was like, yeah, that makes sense, okay, cool. But then after a while, I started to actually realize how true it is. And that was just, um, God has placed a part of himself in each person. There's a piece of God's heart mm. in each person that he has made. Um, there's almost part of his personality, if you want to put it, in each person. Mm. And in living with people like that, you get to see a part of God's heart um, by experiencing the people that he has made. Um, and you learn about God and you learn about yourself and you learn about how life works mm. um, in that. Okay. Um, through the people mm. that Miata provides. And that is so awesome for me because it's not something that Miata can go and be like, okay, this person is done with school. Okay, so this person should be with this person or anything. It's, mm. not, it's beyond Miata's control. Mm. It's literally something that God has planned from the beginning. And that's awesome. And it happens magically by God's design. <laughs> hey, yeah. when strange people are not forced, but chooses for a time to come together yeah. and just go through the experience of discovering Him and discovering yourself. Mm. Mm. It's been two years roughly now. Mm. Mm. How have you seen this effect just, I mean, you spoke about what happened during that year, mm. but now afterwards, mm. if people look at you and say, Bianca, we've seen you before me as a, and after metamorpho. So what can you say has happened that really influenced how you find yourself behaving and thinking even afterwards? I think um, one of the biggest things is <laughs> Mieta made the world bigger for me, but it also made the world smaller and more approachable for me. Um, uh, since Mieta, I've been overseas um, twice and I've been away for extended periods of time. Mm. Um, I have met very interesting people and just done things that I probably would have done anyway, but I would have done in a completely different way and for a completely different reason. Okay. Um, I feel like now I, I'm no longer doing things to prove myself. I'm no longer doing things in order to reach a place where from there I can operate. I'm already at the place where I need to operate from. Mm. And me doing things and meeting people and the way that I interact with people, it's just an extension of what has already been placed inside of me. 90% mm. um, of what I learned at Mieta, I learned after Mieta ended. Mm, applying what you've learned. Eh? Yes, mm. yes. So um, 
bearing in mind the information that you learned and bearing in mind the things that people taught you, mm. it changes the littlest things that sometimes I don't even notice, but it really makes the biggest difference. Yeah. I think if, if young people can be spared testing things in life from a place of need, mm. a place of uncertainty, mm. to like you're saying, where you can meet interesting and, and weird people and strange people and different perspectives, not out of a place of I need to find myself, but I know who I am in Christ. Mm. I know that He called me. I know that He made me the way I am. I've dealt with the things that maybe was out of place. Mm. I think the confidence, hey, and the boldness that you say, mm. um, you've experienced when you met other people. I think young people really need that, don't they? Mm. Mm. Uh, no, I, I because I think in that process, um, a child of God can say, you know what, I'm not a victim of this world. Mm. I'm a victim and I know what's lying ahead. Mm. Uh, Bianca, lastly, and, and very shortly, if people look at this and they're saying, Bianca, you've got an interesting story. Mm. Um, tell me why I should consider. I'm almost finished with school. I'm considering taking a gap year. You know, why should they consider me at the Morpho as one of those? Um. Okay, so if you do Mieta, you will have heard this at least a thousand times. And that is the thing of Mieta is what you make it. Mm. So Mieta is not this thing that, okay, I have to go to this and I have to be this and do this and whatever. It's a place where you decide what happens to you. Mm. It looks very structured maybe and it looks like it's a year of your life that you have to sort of sacrifice. And in a way it is. But for the most part, it is what you make it. It's an investment that you make. It's yeah. you investing yourself. You are deciding how much it makes a difference to you. Mm. Um, so I think when you're just coming out of school, all that you want is a little bit of freedom. Mm. So if you want a little bit of freedom, it's kind of a good way go to go. and find it at the right place. Yeah. Hey? Yeah. yeah. Bianca, it's great to hear what you've experienced. And I think our prayer is that every person will consider to get into a place where God can really work with them in the similar way that you experienced that. Um, may the lessons that you still need to learn um, and apply from Yeta, may that be an exciting journey and may God continue to use you to um, make his kingdom, kingdom grow. Um, bless you and thank you for your time being here today. Thank you so much, Tops. Mm. In this section, I want to come and share something of my story with you that I trust will encourage and empower you to really go out and be the change that you want to see. It all started off with an annual theme that we had in our church called Yeremai Sent Me. At that stage, I was still part of the leadership of Doxa Deo, and I had this desire in my heart to really return into the business world, to go and be a city changer in that sector of our society. Well, who of you know that when you ask God something, He really answers? And he quickly answered my prayer and he gave me the following words to really go and be brave and be fearless and go into the business world and love people well. And with that mandate and background, I started off in familiar ground for me when I went back to a company that I worked for for 13 years. At that stage, it was two businesses that merged together. It was new people and new ideas. It was old people and it had nothing to do with the age of people, but people that were thought of to have an old mindset regarding the processes and procedures that is in the business. Those people knew the industry very well, but in a way resisted the change that needs to come into the business. There were different management styles, there were definite egos, and they were a leadership team that were not quite in unity in terms of how to take this business into the future. On top of that, we had external circumstances. And seven months down the track since I started joining this company, the shareholders intervened, they restructured that whole business, and in one day, 50% of the exco were retrenched, my contract were terminated, and my initial reaction were a lot of fear. Looking back at that, I've realized that this was the best learning ground that any person can ever be in. Because I've realized how unhealthy people and unhealthy working environments can hinder a God-given kingdom vision. But I soon realized that there was something that God placed in me that I can use to help companies to become healthy and to achieve their God-given vision. 
So I took what I had in my hand, which was at that stage a graceful life, a process that will help people to become wholehearted. I combined that with my love for reading. And, and when I read, I read a lot, but I read specific focused things. I read about personal development, about wholeness, about interpersonal relationships, and the dynamic around working in a team together. I also love reading about transformational leadership and how to create healthy relational cultures. I took all of this and developed something that had the potential to transform lives. For the past three years, I had the privilege to facilitate groups of people through life-changing processes in one of the biggest corporate companies in South Africa. And the change and the stories that we hear is affecting the culture in every area that we see. I firmly believe that it is healthy people in healthy relationships that are creating healthy organizations. So to help you as our listener, I want to give you an easy tool that we found in Galatians 6 verse 4 that said, make a careful exploration of who you are and the work you have been given and then go and sink yourself into this. That scripture makes me think about an onion that has different layers of meaning and I just want us to unpack each one of that layers of meaning. First of all, this scripture is saying to us, who are you? What is your story? What is your potential? What is the talents and the knowledge? Where have you grown up and in what way have your environment shaped you or maybe limited you to the thinking patterns that is needed for you to really be effective in the world we are operating in? And then when you made that careful exploration of who you are and you take your story, then it's easy to connect the dots and make sure that you are not dragging something negative of yesterday into your today because that will definitely affect your tomorrow. So my question to you as a listener is, are you wholehearted? And if not, have the courage to deal with whatever is keeping you back, to really take into possession that which has been deposited in you. Then the second layer of meaning is to find your role. Make a careful exploration of who you are and the work you have been given. I truly believe that there is a specific role that each one of us can play. You were created to do something specific. And when you are in that role, there will be passion and purpose. I know of so many people that are working for a salary that they get at the end of the month, but they are not really passionate about what they are doing. And to get to that purpose and passion, ask yourself these three questions. What makes you laugh? What makes you cry? And what do you want to change? What do you want to make better? And if you integrate that, you will find something of your role and purpose in life. The third layer that I want us to explore is that you look at your role within a team context. What do you bring into that team? Are you a humble team player? What I mean with that is that you look at your team members and you look at a person and can say, you know what, your idea is really better than mine. Or I wish I can do things as well as you can do. A humble person knows that I don't have to have all the answers. It's also a hungry person. What we mean with that is that you're constantly out there to see what you can improve and how can you become more excellent in the team context. The last one of a being a good, uh, an amazing team player is to be smart. And that is when you are good in interpersonal skills. And with that, I mean, you know, what is the contribution that you are making into the relational environment that the team are operating in? And when there are issues in a team, don't you want to pause and have the courage to have that difficult conversation so that you can ensure that the relational environment in which you operate is really healthy. The last layer we want to look at is the organization that you are part of. And first of all, my question to you is, do you want to be where you are? It is so important that you work in an organization that you really know, I want to be there. And once you've got the answer to that question is that you make sure that you have clarity regarding what is taking place in the organization. Ask the questions, why do we exist? 
What is our purpose beyond making money? Because that is how we connect our hearts to the why and the purpose of the organization. The second question is, how do we behave? And once you know the values of the organization, ask yourself the question, can I relate my own values to the values of this organization? And then the last one is, what do we do? And what is my contribution that I can, can bring to this organization? In asking the what question, it's what is important right now? What is our focus? Who is doing what? And if, if you are constantly seeking that clarity and you don't wait for somebody to come and tell it to you, you are the curious one to go and find out, to get that clarity. You will soon find out that you are one of those people that are creating to become a healthy organization. So my challenge to you as a listener is, will you become a co-creator of a healthy organization? And the easy things is, stop any negative talk. Stop being so easily offended. Don't participate in gossip. Don't play politics. Be humble. Be a servant. React in the opposite spirit and go and love people well. Because if you do, they will eventually come and ask you about the Jesus that loves you well. God with us, God for us, nothing can come against, no one can stand between us. God with us, God for us, nothing can come against, no one can stand between us. There is healing in your love You're the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit For eternity we will sing of all you
come against no one can stand between 